again. Never many. It's always that kind of work. Can't get a motion to approve the minutes for April. Any comments or questions about it? Make a motion to be motion to approve the minutes. Second. So correspondence. Um, surprisingly, Empire has tabled their proposal until September, till they can get a proposal in order. It looks like. Um, so we'll talk about September about them having RSI, and that's it for correspondence. I guess no one was talking to us this month. So, Don, you're up for academic. Okay, uh, academic committee uh, met. Uh, there was a discussion on stroke transport destinations. Uh, essentially what type of uh, app we want to use or protocol we want to use. Um, and that more or less is going to be tabled in the September meeting when folks have a little more time to look well. Um, fire fire rehab, uh, Dr. Halper's going to send me the USAR fire fighter rehab protocol they have, and Ken also has one that he's going to send, so we can look at both of those. Uh, let's see, there were a bunch of courses at Hudson Valley, Cold Scale, Western Turnpike that are available. See if you guys want to do with details. Uh, long discussion on what we should do with the protocol exam. Um, at the moment, that's sort of been tabled to September as well. Or they could keep it as it is, make it an open book test. Um, also, there was a discussion on Tylenol for ambulance as well as Toradol. And Mike, did you want to comment on that at all? I think we just had a really good discussion here. Um, basically, I think the academic committee seemed to wholeheartedly support the idea of uh, liquid acetaminophen on board ambulances um, and supporting the idea of standing order ketorolac at 15 milligrams uh, for adults. Um, that's going to be an ongoing part of discussion for the collaborative process over the course of the next couple of months. Uh, but I would expect that. Um, Enthusiastic support from the people in here will hold a lot of weight. So, basically, okay. Oh, uh, that is affectionately called the Ush Cow, by addition to the protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it has vodka in it. <laughs> yeah, that's a cocktail. <laughs> that's not a protocol. That's a bar. Uh -huh. um, Remsco was very much a just housekeeping meeting. The bylaws are, I think, set to be voted on next time after another change. Um, they had the auditor come in, and that was pretty much the meeting, so nothing exciting there. Back to you, Doc. Okay. CMAC, what, pertain, what pertains to us, basically, uh, the BLS protocols are being reviewed, but will be hopefully brought up in September for vote. So we're going to bring up that time. With some addition to uh, AEMTs, ability to help out in the Mountain Lakes region. Um, and then there was discussion on New York City Street protocol. That's basically it. Anything else to add? See that? Semsco. Semsco. <coughs> Not sure I've become the Semsco reporter. I guess. At the table. Nothing else happened. That's it. Sure. There you go. Thank you. That's it. QI. Uh, Car, uh, Art was uh, unavailable for today, so we tabled his uh, updates on stroke alerts and first responder data. Um, we got, uh, Deb gave us uh, an overview of some of the um, chart audits. Um, doing a good job in auditing charts, about 57%, but the remainder are fire department uh, charts, so she's working on going over those for new providers. Um, We've had, uh, there was one issue brought to the committee about uh, some IV um, uh, patients showing up in um, uh, a couple of the EDs uh, in Troy uh, with missing uh, caps at the end of their IV extension. So we're digging into that a little bit more to figure out if it's one provider, one service, what's going on. So uh, it's kind of unclear um, what the, the underlying issue is, but we're going to get to the bottom of that. Um, and then um, <clears throat> moving forward, we just talked about uh, a couple of potential um, projects, um, specifically um, 
maybe starting with uh, uh, stroke and trauma transfers to the med to see if there's uh, anything we can do to improve field triage for some of these cases that end up getting sent to one and then transferred to the med. And talk, I guess the meeting was canceled. The main meeting was canceled, next talk meeting in a week from today. So, BLS upgrades, uh, Aviral to East Glenville, Narcan to Scottville, KLS upgrade town of Gilderland, no first responder or EQCR changes. Um, Is this a good question? We have to vote on that ALS upgrade? If I, if I could, I, we have Jay Tyler, uh, Gil, uh, Administrator Don Doyna, the director. I think they want to speak to okay. that town of Gill and ALS Center. You want to go, Don? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, nice try, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to steal your speech to the town council. Um, <laughs> so, the town of Gilliland has been operating an, an advanced life support first response agency since 1987. Started out as a, a police paramedic program. Since then, it's evolved um, uh, into a civilian force of about 21 paramedics. We cover the entire town of Gilliland, which includes uh, the SUNY campus, part of the New York State Thruway, um, the entire town of Knox. Um, we do about 6,200 calls a year. Um, our town council has uh, established a need through Article 30 of the Public Health Law, through the Certificate Municipal CON process. Um, we have the operating authority um, that was voted on last night. What I'm asking from the REMAC um, is that you uh, basically allow us to transfer the ALSFR component to the ambulance. Um, we're a well-established ambulance ALS uh, service. We'll be providing ALS on the ambulance either way, um, but this is a, uh, an issue for billing, and we're not meeting again until September. I've given Tim the package, all the signatures, of the authority, um, and I'm just asking that uh, you let us transfer that and make the ambulance an ALS ambulance. <coughs> Doc? I don't know if anybody has any questions. Essentially, the town will be running one ambulance in conjunction with Western Turnpike. So does this follow the same pathway that the sheriff did in terms of making uh, the ambulances ALS ambulances? Or are, is the town leasing the ambulances from the organization? The, uh, this is I'm not sure the way that, that Albany County did it, um, but the, for, from our perspective, we're buying an ambulance. It's going to be Tom Gillen, um ambulance staffed by town employees uh, in an ambulance. Jay, Jay, is the ambulance sorry? Is, Jay, is the ambulance going to have uh, a separate um, ID agency code than than the ALSFR? I have been in communication with uh, Dana Jonas and and Joe Farrell, and I believe that um, that we'll have it a separate agency code. So, so what your you're, correction is not a transfer, Jay. Right. You need to be sure your That's why is was. very clear. If you transfer, that gets rid of your ALSFR. Right. And that has to go before the council. If you're transferring an op, what you're asking for is ALS privileges okay. for, newly for the new ambulance. Okay. Okay. The, county has, the county has two numbers. They have an ALSFR and their ambulance number. Okay. Well, um, Although they practice in three different ways. I understand they that. A, they do ALSFR, in some cases just jumping out of the ALS ambulance. They do ALS staffing for what had previously been DLS ambulances like uh, Delmar Bethlehem EMS, for example, which is now operating at the paramedic level because of the staffing relationship with the Albany County Sheriff's Department, and then they operate their own ALS ambulance. Right, but the verbiage here is very specific. If you transfer an ALSFR, that means you're transferring that CON. Now, no, I don't think that's we, your intent. We, what we'll be doing is... is uh, that's not the intent. That's not the intent. The intent is exactly. to take a BLS ambulance so what you're exactly. asking for is ALS privileges yes. for this. So, you, so you're asking for this ALS. new ALS for this new ambulance to be ALS. To now, be ALS. with a letter um, to DOH, um, the, the controlled substance license gets transferred. Um, so does the. Uh, it doesn't just get transferred, Jay. Um, that that's what um, Joe Farrell said. I can tell you it doesn't. I handle all those. 
we can talk afterwards. It's not that we'll, hard to we'll, get one. We'll, we'll, we'll talk after. We'll talk um, one. Yeah, um, the main thing before the I think the important thing here is really it's the intent, it's yes. not the semantics. Right. Correct. So I have no doubt that between but the word transfer Kim, has Mary, to be, okay. Joe, but the word transfer has can, to be out. We can get this right. The intent, I think, here, and if I can make the motion, is that if the town of Gilmerwin is established, they would like to operate an ambulance. I believe that it would be entirely appropriate for us to make the motion that they operate that ambulance at the advanced life support level. Thank you. And I certainly will make that. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. On, then. Um, public access. This here doesn't look like it. So one, two originals. Board governments. So new business, uh, RSI agency reports. Who would like to go first? Okay. I'll go ahead. Okay. Unless somebody else. No, go ahead. No. Do you want your? <laughs> did you? If you send slides, we can get them up, or you can just talk. I'll just talk. Okay. Yeah. I'm Al Jagoda, I'm medical director for both Jessup's and Corinth and Moreau EMS, and uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about their MFI programs. Uh, both Moreau and and Jessup's, so the town of Corinth. Uh, they follow the 2017 Collaborative Protocol guidelines established by the REMAC. Uh, both the agencies have developed standards for reporting and, and provider qualification in order to participate in their MFI program. Uh, they both follow semi-annual training uh, in skills verification and they both have 24-hour notification with the medical director when they perform an MFI. Um, Jessup's right now, uh, in 2007, as of 2017, I should say, had 27, I'm sorry, 21 paramedics on staff, and out of those, 11 of those paramedics are credentialed MFI paramedics, and trained uh, uh, are five. So there's a total of 16 paramedic providers that are capable of uh, assisting in a single 41 request. Uh, Moreau has 25 paramedics, uh, well, they had 25 paramedics on staff in 2017. Uh, ten of those uh, are credentialed uh, in MFI and six are trained. Uh, total agency calls for Jessup's or Corinth uh, was 1,073. 1,073. Out of those calls, there were 17, in, 17 innovations. Uh, out of those 17, 12 were cardiac arrests or traumatic arrests, and five were RSIs or MFIs. Moreau EMS uh, for 2017 had 2,507 calls, and out of those calls there were 24 innovations, and those 24 innovations, 11 were uh, arrests, and there were uh, 13 MFI or RSIs. Uh, scene time for Jessup's Corinth, mean time was 34 minutes, a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 50, and for Moreau we had a mean time of 24 minutes, minimum time of 10 minutes, and a maximum of 53. With Corinth, uh, for innovation, or uh, for innovation, we had 11 successful first attempt innovations, four second attempt intubations, and one third attempt. No rescue devices were required. Uh, they do have King Airways available if, if they're needed. Uh, what's interesting about the Corinth is that out of the five MFIs, uh, all five of those were intubated on the first attempt. For Moreau EMS, uh, out of the uh, 13 MFIs, there were eight successful first attempt innovations, four second attempt innovations, and one third attempt. That one third attempt was a pretty difficult case. It was a case of, of a patient who was in status epileptic which required a lot of medication. <coughs> and um, no adverse reactions were reported on either agency from, uh, from the medications used or, or the innovation procedure itself. Uh, both agencies, as I mentioned, participate uh, in semi-annual update classes and skill verifications as well. Uh, we just did a, a, a recent uh, update uh, just uh, two, three weeks ago at Corinth and there's going to be one in Moreau uh, next month. We're also trying to get more RSI or MFI providers uh, on board. And, uh, and the medical director, I, I review all the, all the MFI cases and as, as mentioned, uh, they try to get them to me within 24 hours so I can review them. Any questions?
Scott? I'll go. I do have um, a few slides though. So there's just a, just a couple of slides here. Uh, Craig Stanger, medical director for, for Green County. So Green County um, Fly Car Service been a MFI agency for about 12 years. It was around 2006, 2007. Tim actually was uh, um, setting that up for us uh, along with Albany County. And uh, so what, we've, what I've done is I just reported MFI cases for the last uh, three years. Um, so I don't, I don't have total number of call volume or any of that stuff. So looking back to 2015, um, we did 17 MFI cases. We had uh, a first attempt success rate of about 88%, 15 out of 17. One case required a second attempt. Um, that was 100% success on that. And then there was two failed, um, and the King Airway uh, backed that up, so 100% success rate. So we had no, no failed airways, nobody who died from not being ventilated, nobody who needed a crike or anything like that. Um, breaking down our poor man's RSI, we actually do a fair number of automate-only uh, intubations, and success rate is usually pretty decent. Um, so 35% was automate-only, and 65% uh, uh, used a paralytic. So that was in 2015, so if you notice the number of cases, we had uh, 17 that year. In 2016, Catskill split from, from Greene County, became their own ALS entity. Catskill Rescue is not MFI credential. They are um, ALS paramedic level, but not MFI. So the, the Greene County uh, fly car service took a little hit in the numbers, and so the next 16, 17, and 18 reflect that, that decline in MFIs. So for 2016, we had a total of six cases, 100% um, first attempt uh, for that year, and 50-50 with use of automate only uh, versus a paralytic. Um, also like to make note in 2016 that that's when we purchased uh, the video laryngoscope, and so um, it was mandatory at, at that point on. So 2016, 17, and 18 all are video laryngoscope. Two thousand seventeen. Again, six cases um, with a low denominator. We have uh, you only have to miss one case, and you have a big drop in your success rate. So, so first attempt success was uh, sixty-seven percent. Uh, second attempt was hundred percent, and then one of those six, the first attempt was not verifiable. Um, medic thought she was in, but we never had it um, verified by the. Uh, uh, entitled capnography, and this was a pretty serious case where the helicopter was right there, and uh, the helicopter crew came over and uh, did the next did the next attempt. So, uh, so we never really knew if that case was in or if it was in. It became essentially immediately dislodged. Uh, one case was uh, ketamine only. Uh, the other five required paralytics. And then for this year, we've had three cases uh, up to this point. Uh, first attempt success, 100%. Um, Atomidate only uh, was one that should probably be 33%. Um, and then uh, and then two used uh, paralytic. Um, so in summary, for our last couple of years, we've had a total of 32 cases. Uh, first attempt to success rate is uh, 88%. First attempt success since our video laryngoscope um, is 87%. Total number of cases requiring a paralytic is uh, about 70%, and then overall that steep decline in numbers since uh, Catskill split from the from the Green County program. That's all I got. Any uh, any questions? Thank you. All right. Thanks. Good. I gotta ask. That's a huge drop from 15 to 16. Um, do you get a sense that patients are being hurt because of the lack of access to this? Not really. The only thing is because Catskill's proximity to CMH, mm -hmm. and they're basically taught that 
proximity to the hospital is a relative contraindication to doing an MFI. So, so Catskill is probably uh, doing more CPAP, BLS airways because of the fact that they're typically 10 to 15 minutes from CMH. I guess, I guess the question I would have is, you know, how many of those patients are, were trauma patients that should not have gotten a CMH for their airway, but should have headed north? Right. I um, looked at the spreadsheet that uh, Steve had collated. We had, it was probably about one-third trauma. Um, I didn't include that on there, but uh, the, the majority of these cases being reported are medical cases. And uh, the, a good bulk of the trauma cases that um, have been intubated, very few come to CMH. Either they fly um, or they're taken by ground to AMC. You know, I'm thinking particularly about that group that's not being intubated, right? Now. Oh, right, right. And going yeah. across the river, or are they going across the river and then coming back north and across the river? Right. Yeah, but our trauma, our trauma received has come has gone down. We've done a lot of education in the last two years with uh, Casco and Green County and Columbia County from the ER to the EMS agencies. Mm -hmm. So our number of traumas and our trauma transfers have gone directly. Really yeah. yeah. I don't think there's that many. Good. Only one question on the 2018 data. Yeah. And I'm not sure I necessarily agree, but we've had this discussion before. For RSIs, everyone should be getting induction agent, everyone should be getting a pyrolytic agent here. We ended up having cases that were RSIs that didn't receive any pyrolytic. Yeah, I, th I think some of the medics are still following the our, our previous years of training, which was if you think that you have ideal intubating conditions after the induction agent alone, they're going for it. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of slowly try and transition everyone to, uh, to a full parallel. Is there any relationship between the second attempt and whether they got paralytical without paralytic? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't. I didn't get a sense of that. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the second attempt was done immediately there, uh, and and was um, appropriate adjustments were made whether there was a paralytic on board or not. Great presentation, Dean. Along Don's uh, discussion. I'm a little concerned about the ketamine only because ketamine does not affect airway reflexes at all. And you're just begging to aspirate with that one uh, if you don't combine it with a paralytic right. or you do nebulized lidocaine, things that EMS doesn't do. Yeah. So it just as you roll out your teaching, I'd throw that out and just remind you. Not, ketamine not, does not, not a huge fan of that uh, in that case uh, either. Um, we did 62 intubations last year. Of those, 25 were done with RSI. Uh, 22 were successful on the first attempt. One was successful on the second. One was successful on the third. And then there was one rescue device placed. Um, for that rescue device, it was a very large patient. The paramedic went in on his first attempt, couldn't identify anything, immediately pulled out and dropped the king in. He didn't want to make any additional attempts. Uh, our mean seeing time was 39 minutes. Minimum was 17, maximum was 62 minutes. Um, as a result of these numbers, I instituted a guideline within our agency for a 30 minute target seeing time. Because some of our seeing times are starting to creep up, so I put a, um, a goal out there for everyone to shoot for. We have 40 credentialed uh, paramedics. We don't use the, the training level at all. Everyone goes through skills and training every single month. All 40 providers have to do that. Um, we also utilize the Rebel transport ventilator um, for all of our patients as well. Dr. Danik has had no additional comments he wanted to make uh, when I showed him all this information. I think that's it then. I think uh, we've got to do ours. Yeah. County EMS, um, 12,000 total calls. Uh, out of those, 22 were MFI. Uh, seven were trauma patients, 15 were medical. Uh, two cases required um, three attempts. We had two rescue devices deployed, two King Airways. Uh, one was managed BLS. She was an anatomical issue. They couldn't even get an OPA in her. When they placed the King and inflated the balloon, the King literally popped out of her mouth. Um, using a lot more video now, and we've discovered that 
anything in the airway, um, emesis, blood, saliva is clouding our camera and um, causing an issue. Um, we had two cases where the heart rate decreased, um, both required atropine. Um, no disasters, um, all managed well. And we have a, a similar automate only intubation um, rate. Same, I think we have the same issue. A lot of providers doing this a long time, and they get ideal conditions and they just go for it. Any comments? Um, Dylan EMS, our report is from uh, January 2017 to April 15, 2018. Um, we, and that dur during that time, period we had 7,100 calls. We had uh, 65 cardiac arrests, 50 intubations, and 7 RSIs. The medications were used were Atomidate and SUX um, in accordance with the protocol. We have 21 paramedics, 10 credentialed, the rest trained. We do use the, the trained um, credentialed um, system. Um, it's not mandatory, but we're moving towards the um, um, the, the King Vision as, as the uh, optimal at least and, and hopefully we can get everybody trained to the level of proficiency where they'll be using the King Vision uh, on all our size and maybe all intubations. We train quarterly um, with uh, RSI. Um, our seen time for MF RSI cases, the mean time, seen time was 26 minutes, the minimum was 16 and the maximum was 20, uh, 41. Um, we had one I guess, failed intubation. Um, however, in this case, it was um, intubated with direct visualization. There was uh, confirmed breath sounds in, in the lung fields with nothing over the ep epigastrium. However, the crew did not get, uh, did not get adequate end tidal. So they elected to pull the tube and they were a couple minutes away from the hospital. So they ventilated the patient, patient with a, a BVM. Um, Dr. Duino? That was it. Rob, just uh, two agencies actually. So, Valicia Rescue, we didn't get approved until the end of 2017 um, with a start date, a target start date of January 1. We didn't actually get live until mid February due to some equipment procurement issues. So, I did not prepare a report for Valicia, assuming that you wanted 2017 info and we weren't live until then. If you want some uh, report in September, I'd be happy to put one together by then. Um, anecdotally, I'll tell you, we have not done any RSIs yet. We did have one that the crew said while we were waiting for that equipment, they would have done. <laughs> so, um, as it may be. Uh, and for Albany County, um, many of you probably know that we're in the middle of a transition of, uh, of leadership. So Brian Wood, who was our captain, moved up to, uh, I guess he's gonna be Inspector Wood, uh, with the uh, critical incident, no, not critical incident, a critical incident emergency management unit um, and so Dennis moved up to captain and I took Dennis's spot so um, I did not have enough time to put together a report I will have one for you at the next uh, at the next meeting and I'm sorry I had, didn't get a list of all the agencies so I'm kind of you know it's all good looking around for you guys to jump in I think um, the one thing Rob, that I think is important that every single agency talked about is everybody's looking at the high 80s or better for their percentage of intubation success you know, we're just looking at papers nationally on outcomes from procedures. You know, Wang just published a paper talking about how intubation is bad. And he was talking about an overall airway success rate of 50% at the agencies where they showed uh, poor outcomes. Um, this region does not uh, equate to that. You can't look at that paper and say, this gives us information about how we should change our practice here. I think maintaining the skill set um, at this high performance level is important for us. Uh, and I think the agencies that just reported out and demonstrating they're doing that exactly the way we want them to do for their patients. So. But you could wonder if the flags look at our agencies and figure out why his agencies are so poorly. <laughs>
Well, they're not his agencies. Well, He's looking wherever. at this massive data, right? Wherever. Through, okay. through Rock and some of the some of the places that he is looking, uh, they don't do things well at all, which gives us a chance to look really good. Yeah, exactly. So 50% so is pretty bad pre-RSI. Mm -hmm. right. As a general comment, I noticed throughout all the presentations uh, some very good judgment. People deciding to give up after they've, excuse me, after they've started and to then go to a rescue airway device. I mean, that's a hard decision to make to say, I'm going to stop this and do something else because everyone wants to get the tube. So I applaud those people for making that decision to putting the patients first, not their ego. Do we need a motion to accept all the reports? Or are we just... Okay. I'll second. Okay. Motion. Reports accepted. Um, so, drug shortages. Mike. Drug shortages, they continue. <laughs> some, some in particular we will not probably get an answer for. Um, Diltiazem is one of them. Um, some people have come the idea of can we use a large quantity of Diltiazem and then draw off it. Uh, that was specifically addressed by the CMAC a couple of years ago and the answer the CMAC said was no. Uh, just use single patient doses of, of Diltiazem so we don't get a Diltiazem <laughs> drip on by mistake. Um, you know, when I looked at one agency in particular, we were looking at an incredibly small proportion of the patients that were going to get DILT anyway, and um, we elected to not find an alternative source of dilt ISM and go without. That may very well be the best answer uh, using theta blockade in many of these patients. But dilt ISM um, is on Dancitron intravenous. Um, going on shortage, the ODT is actually still available. Um, so my suggestion to everybody is give them whatever else you want to IV, but give them the ODT Zofran. The unfortunate thing is if you give them IV Zofran and IV morphine, you get an ALS2 billing code. If you give them IV morphine and oral Zofran, you are stuck at ALS1. Uh, sorry. Don't have another answer. No, you can't mix the oral Zofran <laughs> in a little bit of saline and give it IV. Please don't do that. Reconstitute it? What? You can't reconstitute it? Can't reconstitute it. Exactly. Can you split your morphine into two doses? Right. No. Split the morphine. Give two. Give two. It actually literally has to be different Two different drugs. Yeah, it's got to be two different drugs. Um, so, <laughs> what was that? Protonics? <laughs> yeah, because that's not going to break the bank. It's not going to hurt them. Just give them a little Benadryl. Mm -hmm. So, um, drug shortages will continue. Um, we'll get out information whenever we can. So we got One, uh, color reductions. Um, please pass on to your agencies, and if you hear about cases, if anybody does a patella reduction, uh, there is a patella reduction data collection form that's on the Remo website. Please have them complete that. I did it with one paramedic the other night who had done a spectacular job of doing a reduction. The patient was really enthusiastic about it. Um, the other thing with that is um, that data will ultimately end up getting reported out on a broader basis. So far, we're seeing about 90% success in patella reductions. Uh, pain scales are going from near 10 down to well, just one or two. And it's uh, been a huge success um, with that procedure. So please make sure of that. The other thing is if somebody does the procedure and uses EMS charts as your documentation system, there actually is a joint reduction procedure available in EMS charts. So we can find it in there. So please pass that on to your crew. Jay, sorry. Doc, I, I missed, um, there's a form on the website or? Uh, there's a link on the Remo website to the, to the form itself. Okay. And what we'll do is get you that link. Um, if you asked him for that link, you can give it to you and put it in the, in the minutes yep. as well. Do you want me to jump right, right into Might legislative well. update? Um, so as you guys know, um, I'm on the, I'm not used to getting walk-up music. Kind of <laughs> uh, uh, I'm on the ASEP board. I just wanted to tell you guys a couple of things that we were uh, doing, and Frank, please fill in anything as, as we go. Um, 
couple of things that are particularly pertinent to the docs in the room and uh, everybody else may be interested in some too. Uh, the first is uh, ASAP as a group is continuing to oppose any revisions to the PMP that would require us in the emergency department to consult it every time we uh, prescribe a controlled substance um, and that so far has been met relatively well. Um, ASAP has issued a memo in support of community paramedicine and is actively working to try to push that forward. Um, we're seeing success with some of the smaller pilots that are being done within the confines of Article 30, and that's been very helpful. Um, there have been a lot of discussions, both the Senate and the Assembly, as well as um, on the, uh, the um, governor's staff about the idea of community paramedicine where this um, could go. Um, and we're working hard to make sure that some of the concerns that some groups have had are being uh, addressed. Um, there is a bill out there right now uh, which would require every practitioner who administers naloxone to report it into the prescription monitoring program. Uh, which would be a very difficult process to say the least and may actually go backwards to then require the emergency physician that gets the patient from EMS who got naloxone to have to report it into the PMP. Um, the potential administration of this is unbelievably difficult and the return on it because people don't look at the PMP when they go into the, your primary care doctor's office that the primary care doctor is not going to look at the PMP to see what you've been up to since you last came in. Um, it's not going to get back there. Plus, it would be reporting out all of the people that we give naloxone to who weren't opioid overdosed in the first place. So all those intoxicated people with wet noses that come to the emergency department would have to be reported out. Um, so I think this is a, a bill that has some really good intent to it, the goal being to get data back to both pharmacists that help take care of patients and primary care doctors who take care of patients. But unfortunately, I think it's, um, it's something that is a little misguided. Um, so we've been working on a couple of different forums to try to help work on straightening that one out. Um, another, which is similar, would require any time a patient is treated in an emergency department for an issue surrounding a controlled substance, it would require that emergency physician to notify the department and therefore the patient's original prescriber. That would be incredibly difficult also. So lots of time spent in discussions to try to um, make sure people understand what we do. And the last bill that we had spent some time talking about was one that would require physicians to report to the Department of Motor Vehicles every time somebody has a condition which causes unconsciousness or unawareness, not limited to a convulsive disorder, epilepsy, fainting, dizzy spell, or coronary ail ailments would be required to report to the medical unit of the Department of Motor Vehicles every single time a patient came in with this. If you think about it, a lot of the medications we prescribe actually have the side effect of dizziness. So every time you prescribe somebody Benadryl, for example, you would have to report it according to the way this is written. Again, I think this is uh, something with a really good intent and the idea of keeping our roads as safe as possible, uh, but it oversteps that with a very, very broad hammer rather than being more of a surgical strike that people actually are a risk on the roads. So um, we're working hard to try to make sure that our practice doesn't start to degrade to just being a reporting service. Any questions? It seems like every sentence you said there started with, they would like to require physicians to. Right. <laughs> It would be nice if exactly. they would just make it super easy for us to report people that were concerned about their driving abilities for any reason. If they could make that super easy, that if we had any concerns, boom, done, one step. That, that actually sounds effective. exactly like what we what we talked about with um, some of the members of the, of the assembly the other day. Mm -hmm. In particular, we talked about the fact that if we were able to do that and report people to the medical um, medical review unit of the Department of Motor Vehicles, 
with the indemnification that we get with child abuse reporting, that would be very, very helpful. Because then when you've got somebody that you're really concerned about, but at the same time you're concerned about you being the one that takes away their independence with everybody pointing at you, um, that might give us an opportunity to do that better. I think Pennsylvania has similar legislation to that. Yes. With, that. with seizures, there was indemnification on the seizure the reporting seizures, in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Exactly right. But to try and name every condition which could affect their driving and make us report all of those <coughs> is ridiculous. I think you need another one where the Department of Health hires a scribe to do all the reporting for us in each position. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. But they'll need to be just do that because we need a scribe to do a regular job. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anything else? I don't have any, anything active from old business. Okay. So if there's a motion to adjourn, we'll average out and be much better than the almost three hours last month. Actually, there was one one other thing that's on here, hiding, which is naloxone data sharing. I thought we were doing that. So there is um, a request from a couple of the um, counties to get data from Remo for locations of overdoses on an aggregated either weekly or monthly basis. Um, I frankly think this is a fantastic idea in terms of developing more of a heat map process. It's not quite the um, OD map uh, that for some reason we still can't seem to get any movement on with the Department of Health, um, but I think it offers some benefit I wanted to bring it here just for discussion amongst the, the group, um, to see if anybody sees any downsides of sharing locations of overdose. How, how would you, so Paul and I just spent a lot of time looking at geocoding and working with mapping and doing stuff at the EMS charts <coughs> conference. How, how would you propose that Remo, this, how's the staff gonna do that if the agency hasn't signed up? So just in the EMS charts customers, if the agency hasn't signed up for geocoding in the first place, how are they going to get that location? Are we talking about just sending out a list of zip codes and how many there were? It would, it would be that much at, at this point, at that level? Yes. Not so addresses. What? No, not, not addresses. Address. Not addresses. So there's a certain amount of that already going on from, not from the image charts platform, but from the image trend platform. We can get an automated report at scheduled intervals, whether it be daily, or weekly, and you can get that automa automated on a regular basis, on a regular cycle. And we're already doing some of that. Um, I think Tim gets those emails on a re regular day basis. But um, you can, and it's, I think it's, we're doing it for the entire region, obviously, we're doing it for the region. And it's anybody who electronically reports. So that goes back to the reporting cycle, and as we move to Nepsis 3, the reporting cycle is gonna be basically real-time reporting. As soon as you lock the chart, you got a few things that goes, but within like four or five minutes, that chart ends up at the state's database, and that data is available for the next reporting cycle. Um, right now, because we're on, on uh, Nemesis 2, and we're actually transitioning this week, we're starting the transition, um, that data is somewhat delayed, but that process is already there and can be configured by county or by the region or however you want to define it with a little bit of tweaking at the um, the Department of Health already. So you're suggesting just get the Department of Health to do it and be done with? Well, if I well, can, if I can speak it. to that. Yeah, they, they have a great tool on here right now. It's, it's a daily Narcan report that goes to the regions or the REMS goes. I actually asked Peter Brody if we could have this go out to the agencies as well. I believe that is a work in progress, but this is a tool that gives you a 24-hour report in your region as to how many times Narcan is used which agencies used it, the locations it was used on, and so forth. If you want to start some trending or tracking and stuff like that, it's a great tool. We just have to get DOH to free it up to the region as, as opposed to just to the REMSCOs and the program agencies. So I did meet with Peter, and that is a work in progress. So. Good. Let's keep on pushing on that and then yeah. use that to get out. I think it's great. Good. Thanks, Tim. Any other discussion? One other thing that was just handed, <laughs> not, my fault, not my fault, her fault. Um, there's a survey on workforce that's been sent out by the department. If your uh, agency has not completed the workforce survey, please do. Thanks.
Okay. Second yourself. Okay. 